Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Dan Nault, and uh, I work in the AWS team in the database, analytics, and artificial intelligence portfolio. I lead the customer programs team. And joining me today is Scott Donaldson. He's the senior director of technology at FINRA, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. And that's a non-government regulatory agency, for those that don't know, that looks over all the security companies that do business with the investor public, 90 million of us or so. And it looks at tens of billions of events to see if something happens that is a pattern and then works through the consequences. So Scott was a principal in moving essentially all their database and analytics over to the cloud over the past three years, which is quite a statement. And you know, really pleased to have his teamwork here today as we, uh, as we talk through these different things. So to get started, uh, we have a broad portfolio of data serv services across the data database in the top left corner, the analytics in the top right, artificial intelligence in the bottom right, and then the migration portfolio to help you accelerate your move to the cloud across these 20 so services. And I, I want to start by saying that over 90% of our services and features are driven by your requests and your desires. Desires to make the apps better, the experience better. Better can look like easier to deploy and run, more responsive and reliable, less expensive to maintain, those sorts of things. And you can notice that we have a mix of open source and commercial databases. On the open source front, we've got, starting on the left, MySQL, uh, MariaDB, PostgreSQL, and the commercial engines, it's Oracle and SQL Server. And then, of course, there's Aurora. The Amazon created Aurora, which is the highest scalability and performance. Uh, moving just to the right of that, there's the non-SQL, the uh, rela non-relational and in-memory databases. And that's in the case where you need to have uh, very high scale um, for the, the largest range on that. We'll go into some details on that. Um, Moving over to the right, there's a range of analytics services, inline data warehousing, data lake, and then reporting, and we'll talk through that. A lot of different open source services, and I'll just call out that there's a, a very um, vibrant wave of on-premises data warehouses moving over to Redshift and then the decoupling of data with Redshift Spectrum that I'll go into in some detail on that. Finally, on the right, you can see some of our services for extract, transform, and load, serverless query with Athena, and then also QuickSight for visualization. Now, you might already know that artificial intelligence is a growing part of the AWS data platform. And I'll talk about the, the deep learning engines underneath that, the machine learning platforms, and then also the services to add voice or pictorial capabilities to any of the applications. So rounding out the platform, I'll talk about migration. That's an area of the business I personally run. That's being used for a wide range of different use cases. Uh, whether modernization or just migrating across different engines, and that's both non-relational and relational engines. So there's kind of a, a portfolio view across the different services that have evolved over time. Across these services, there's quite a bit of momentum. And there's a number of logos up here. You'll probably recognize several of them, as do I. And there's over 2,300 government agencies that are using these services. Three times that, 7,000 educational institutions and more than 22,000 nonprofits that are represented here. And it's great to have this kind of momentum from all the way across the public sector and appreciate the support of all of our customers and partners in, in this area. So now I'm going to start by going deeper into the database portfolio, both the relational and then the non-relational on memory. Then I'll follow up with the same thing on analytics. So I'll start with RDS. The foundation for our relational database is our relational data service, or RDS. So to start with, it's a big TCO win. It's easier, it's better, and if you take a look at it, you can see a lot of customer choices, a lot of automation, and then just frankly a lot of innovation and capability in that. So there's really five engines that are available. When you take a look at the top up there, you can see that there's MySQL, Postgres, Maria, Oracle, and SQL Server. And then Aurora, which I've talked about. I'll talk more about that. That's the highest level of performance, reliability. And uh, we have the, in market, the, the MySQL capability of Aurora. It's our fastest growing service ever. And PostgreSQL is currently in, in, in open preview. Um, for the commercial engines, you can either bring your own or rent from us by the hour, and the rest are basically part of the service. So, RDS is a platform, it automates the heavy lifting. And when I say the heavy lifting, 
Now, people sometimes say that poorly or inadequately managed database is a leading cause of downtime and lost sleep. We try to take care of the vast majority of that for you, so that's the maintaining high performance, high availability, the patching, the scaling, all the various things that normally couldn't be done prior to this kind of a service. Now, to quantify that, about 25% of IT time goes into infrastructure, and then about two-thirds goes into the management, leaving around 10% for, I'm going to say, the innovation that helps your business, right? The things that get to help you hoard your talent, to leverage your team, and then all focused in the areas that serve your mission. We can take care of that. Now, a bottom line point here about high availability with the multiple availability zones, it wor it's worth amplifying on a little bit. So we've built that in, and it's not just multiple availability zones, but it's across different geographies. This is for all engines, including the standard version. So if you're running a standard version of one of these products, or the lower end version, you get that high availability with over 99.95% .9 availability for any of the versions. And a way to think about this is our experience running Amazon.com has taught us a lot about what it takes to manage, operate, design, build databases, relational databases with high availability. And we bring all of that learning to our customers. So let me click into this high availability a little bit more. So enterprise grade fault tolerance with a click is a way to think about it. Automatic failover, synchronous replication constantly, very inexpensive to do. So we do all of the things behind the background. So if there's a primary fails, which is shown by the, the red over there, so if the primary fails, then what happens basically there is the app keeps running, the standby gets promoted to the primary, and then a new standby kicks over automatically on any of these services that are provisioned this way for a click. And that is uh, certainly transformational and frees up a lot of time to do other things, let me say that. Um, so I've talked about Aurora. Let me, let me click into Aurora a little bit more. Aurora is, is our highest innovation from the different things we've done. And what makes it different and brings you the speed and availability of commercial databases with the, the cost effectiveness of open source is, is that it was built specifically to use the AWS infrastructure. Now, most relational database technologies were built to scale vertically in a fairly monolithic way for each instance. To get very high tra transactional volume on that and high availability and high durability is hard. It takes a lot of engineering to maintain that performance, availability, that kind of durability. So we built this at Aurora to take advantage of all of our infrastructure. I and mean, I'll click into that in another slide. But in addition to the innovation, we made it perfectly compatible with MySQL and now PostgreSQL which is in open preview. And for customers that are looking at potential options for some of their Oracle workloads, the semantic compatibility of PostgreSQL makes the migration over the simplest migration choice uh, of, of, of what we could offer. Now there's some specifics by the math here. Five times the performance of high-end SQL, of the th throughput, a tenth of the cost of commercial grade databases. These are uh, very compelling, attractive things. And that is what contributes to it being our fastest growing service ever since it launched in July 2015. So it's the enterprise class performance, but without having to have an expensive third party solution. And th the other thing is it's completely consumption based in sense of pay as you go. So there is no underlying license cost for our commercial grade database of this offering. So what makes Aurora so compelling? So I'm going to contrast the two, taking a look at MySQL with Amazon Aurora. And just looking at that, you can notice there's a lot of data flowing around within MySQL and a much simpler data flow in Aurora. So I'm going to, I'm going to click through what that, what's happening right there. So typically, you have to write everything to a disk. So you write down to the first disk, and then that mirrors the disk. And then you have to go over to the other replica, down to a disk, down to the other disk. And that's just a lot of bandwidth. That's just a lot of data flowing around. Take a look at Aurora. All that you're moving over is the logs. And the numbers down below show how compelling that is. When you move over the logs, 35% more transactions, almost 8% fewer transactions in, 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 uh, in uh, IOs per transaction for the sysbench run. And that's just simply because less data is having to flow around. And there's a little bit more than that. The way we've set this up, 
it's, uh, the data is asynchronously written in a distributed manner, and as soon as you get four out of six, you have a quorum. And then for failover, for high availability, we keep three instances of sync, and that also offloads some of the read traffic. And, and that is what drives this kind of performance with this kind of efficiency. And it's, it's something that would happen if you took all of the innovation of the open ecosystem with MySQL and then all of the innovation of AWS and brought them together with that capability. And that's, that's the Aurora story. So I'm gonna move over now from talking about the relational database to NoSQL database, and specifically DynamoDB, which we developed for our own usage to provide very stable, low latency performance regardless of how many transactional requests you need to support. And with many of our services, the durability comes from replicating across multiple physical facilities. Provisioning Dynamo is very simple. It's really three things. You define your table, you set up your keys, and then you dial the read and write traffic that you need. We scale the back end for you. You don't have to pay attention to that. And if you change those settings, we'll dynamically change that infrastructure to scale with you. You can imagine this is something that we would need to manage the scale of an Amazon.com type of capability. Now there's something that we just added that's very substantial, the DynamoDB Accelerator, which we call DAX. And that's a caching mechanism, an in-memory caching mechanism that dramatically increases performance. So let me quantify the dramatic increase in performance. So the way you enable using DAX, because uh, it, uh, you don't have to make any coding changes for it, you just point directly to DAX rather than to DynamoDB. You offload the read traffic, and if it's a key that gets hit regularly, you can get 10 times the performance. And that API compatibility makes it super simple to deploy. You just route to it, no coding changes. So this is available in preview, and now the preview is available in the US East one, over in the West two, and then also over in Ireland in EU West one. Very uh, popular service, and let me give you an example of it at, a, uh, at you know, one of our customers working with a partner. So Amtrak uh, teamed up to, uh, to work with Deloitte on their, their data warehouse for sales. And it was using typical legacy technology, uh, expensive to maintain, but more importantly, the accuracy, the speed that they needed to maintain their business relative to what else was available. It took them six months from concept to being done. And they used DynamoDB for all of the core storage, but they used Kinesis, Lambda, S3, as part of the family. So much lower operational cost, and then they could retire four of their applications. Uh, no services to manage, much lower operational cost, and more importantly, they could go to real time, near real time, rather than daily batch because of the speed and the scale of what they could do at Dynamo. Now, if you wanna learn a little bit more about the Amtrak journey, there's a session at 2 p.m. today in, in room 206 to learn more about that. One of the things I love about this is it's something that's very easy to associate with, right? Um, so I'm gonna move over a little bit and talk about another one of our, um, our non-relational database services, which is Elastic Cache. So that's an in-memory cache, and you'll see some affinity on this with DAX. It's, uh, it basically, it's a, it's a managed implementation of very popular Redis and Memcached. And you can think of it a little bit like a shock absorber for your database. So it functions similarly to DAX, but the difference is it'll work with just about any database. So rather than being wired directly in Dynamo, it's separate. And then you integrate it in at the persistence layer of your app. And similarly, it can speed up a high read workload that you're hitting multiple times with sub millisecond performance, which will certainly reduce the load on your databases as expensive as they might be. So whichever database you're using, you can do that. So now we've taken a look at the relational family, the RDS family, the open source, the commercial, Aurora, we talked about Dynamo, we talked about ElastiCache. That kind of concludes our, our tour through the database portion of the AWS data platform. So now I wanna click over and talk about analytics. So in addition to the database side, there's a family of rich tools for big data and for analytics whether it's in line with EMR and Elasticsearch, data warehousing and data lake or over on the reporting side and ETL, which I'll go through. And these also can be provisioned very dynamically to help you move through a lot of data. So as you can see, these two kind of work left to right together. 
And, and I'll start with EMR, Elastic MapReduce, which is the first analytic service that we, that we launched. We came out with this in 2009. It's one of our, our bigger services. And uh, over time, it's moved from just Hadoop to Hadoop, Spark, Presto, and Hive. And what's great about these is they're a natural fit for the cloud because they're, they grow elastically. You could put vast resources to an analytics job of pretty much any scale. So seeing that, we built this managed service to make it easy to use the cloud for these, these big data things, which has certainly grown over time. You can use this for a lot of things, analyzing your unstructured data, your semi-structured data. Um, you can bring in multiple data sets, a lot of different formats to bring it together. Uh, and it can be for large-scale jobs, batch jobs, ETL, all of these within this engine. And similarly, you configure it with a few mouse clicks. It's very simple to configure. You launch up clusters. And then what's great is you can use any of the tools from the ecosystem that you want to use, that you're used to. You just load them up and then use it to manage anything that's in EMR. Um, now, one of the other things that's nice is you can have very persistent clusters that you're running 7x24. And uh, you can run that with any of the, uh, the S3 pricing plans that you might want to do with that. Or you can have clusters that are transient. You stand them up. You run them for a while. And then you go shut them down so you're not paying the cost to go do that. That's a key part of... I'm going to say the flexibility of the power of it. And as I mentioned, it works well with S3, S3 for very large volumes. You can do that. It can mount S3 as a file system, essentially, to ingest data in. And then you can use Presto to go at the data directly. So you can scale you know, virtually limitless amounts of data, similarly to how do you think about DynamoDB. Um, so the next one over is the Elasticsearch service. It's a little bit newer. It's been out for about a year and a half now. And it's a very versatile service. It's used for a lot of different things. So uh, it's, it's a combination of the open source service by the same name, Elasticsearch, and then also has Kibana and then integration with Logstash. Now, it doesn't just integrate with those industries. It integrates with many of the other AWS services that's part of the platform strategy. So AWS IoT, Kinesis Firehose, S3, CloudWatch, CloudTrail, integrates with all of those. But you can very, very quickly stand up an Elk stack and then ingest large volumes of data. And uh, a lot of this is done for log files, a huge amount of log files, because it's got Kibana uh, built in. So you can quickly have a dashboard against a lot of these different log files. And uh, there's also text search is a very common thing. And just to, to ground it in something we can probably mostly all associate with, Alexa, Amazon Alexa is just one example of the use case. So it, it ingests the data and indexes it for easy researching across. So what you've just heard is a number of different services on the database, on the analytics side, that we developed and use internally for running our different platforms at, at Amazon and also services that are familiar to you. And, and on that theme, I want to talk about Redshift. Now, uh, Redshift is a, a pretty remarkable product uh, given the strong bent of migrating from the on-premises proprietary data warehouses onto something that's more elastic in the cloud. And there's the basic capability with Redshift, and then I'm going to talk about Redshift Spectrum, which allows you to look across both Redshift clusters and data that's in S3. Data warehousing is a very natural fit for cloud computing. Scaling out across a lot of different nodes, uh, Redshift is massively parallel processing, so MPP, it uses columnar state storage, as is typical for a lot of data warehouses, which makes it really uh, well amenable for analytics processing. Uh, now, there's a lot of data warehouse solutions that are on the market. There's really three things that, that make Redshift demonstrably different. The first is that it's fully elastic. Fully elastic so you can provision a warehouse all the way from less than a terabyte to a couple of petabytes in size, and then grow and shrink elastically. Uh, if you need more capacity, just go to the console, provision it. In this case, we'll build a new cluster, copy your data over, and then switch over to the new cluster for you. So all that's automatic on our part. Uh, the next is it's, it's completely utility-based in the pricing. There's no licenses to buy. You just pay for what you use. And just like with the MR, you can either have persistent that you keep, or you can have some that are transient that you use for a short while and then bring down. So tremendous flexibility in that. So the third is that it's fully managed. We do the backups, the sizing, the patching, all that for you. You just basically stand it up, provision as I've talked about, load in your data, start analyzing the data. And 
There's a range of instance types for you, data warehousing, there's a lot of different use cases and a lot of different speeds that are needed. You can go all the way from very low cost, under $1,000 a terabyte for a year using magnetic storage, all the way to if you need high speed, you can get to solid state storage and you can have 10 times the performance because of the elasticity and scale out of the other solutions that are available. So we've just now talked about a number of different ways to look across terabytes and then even petabytes of data. But sometimes with this explosion of data that we all have, we know customers want to have data at even higher scale. So ingesting many petabytes into a Hadoop cluster or data warehouse can get pretty impractical, but we have the data down in S3. So there's two different tools that help with this problem. I'm gonna talk about each of them separately. Amazon Athena and then Amazon Redshift Spectrum. So they do similar things, but they do it in quite different ways. So Athena is a general purpose serverless query engine running over S3, and it uses Presto inside to do relational queries, and it uses structured formats all the way from JSON to parquet or comma separated values, whatever you might want, and it's pretty simple to use. You, you basically create the table, use your favorite BI tool, again, that flexibility to analyze and query the data, and you only pay for the data that you're querying. There's no license cost, it's a pay as you go for the data that you're querying. Um, so that, that's one type of capability. Another capability though is in Spectrum, and the way Spectrum works is it extends Redshift so that you can go look at the data lake that's in S3. So in this case, you basically provision a cluster of servers that are in Redshift, and then you join the data with that with what's in S3 and look across both of them. And you know, we were able to query an exabyte of data on historical book sales at Amazon.com, all historical book sales, to go predict the success of a particular title and volume in under three seconds, or under three minutes, which is just uh, an amazing capability to look at that, that broad of a capability to do that. So now I'm gonna move over and talk about, uh, about Glue. So Glue is a new service, it's still in preview, but it's serverless ETL. And it does really three things. It creates a data catalog, and the data catalog is a metadata repository that crawls the data sources to understand the formats and the relationships. It does that automatically. And then to author the different jobs, Glue generates Python code, which you can then edit to move or transform the data from the source to the destination. And then job execution is done in Spark containers. And we ramp up the number of servers based upon what you need. And similarly, because it's serverless, you only pay for what you use in Glue. So Glue is definitely something that, uh, you know, still using it in preview, and I look forward to it being available in market. I also, uh, I also talked about QuickSight a little bit. I, wanna, I wanted to click into QuickSight a little bit more. You can think of QuickSight as the AWS user interface into the data in the database and analytics tool sets. So it's a fully cloud-based business analytics tool and it understands a wide range of database formats, whether it's in the cloud or on-prem. It understands Excel, CSV, and it can query down from Athena or other SaaS vendors. And it can directly query the source. Uh, and it loads data into Spice, the super fast parallel in-memory calculation engine that's in the core of it. And then it can construct a data source from a data source and start visualizing and analyzing data within minutes. And I use it almost daily and it helps you save queries into a dashboard that can be shared with a mobile client. Uh, so as you can see, there's a, a set of things across inline, data warehousing and data mart, and then other capabilities in the reporting area, and then the ETL capability, taking a look at the, the analytics. So now we've talked about the database part of the portfolio, and we've talked about the analytics part of the portfolio. So that wraps that up. So now I want to shift themes a little bit. And I want to shift themes to something that we hear from database customers, that they like some of the things that they're hearing from us more than a lot of things that they might have heard in the past. And they want to get free of what I'll call the old world policies. And you can think of those policies in economics, in choice, in the ability to embrace leading edge innovation through openness and design, and then business practices. And you might have seen this slide a few times even from reInvent where we talk about they're very expensive, they're proprietary, they're locked in by design, and then they have 
licensing terms we call punishing. And then for those that haven't gotten an email that's untimely that says, hey, you're being audited, well, we're just having a lot of customers say they've kind of had enough of this and they'd like some help from us. And you've heard the theme DB freedom and how it starts with choice. Um, and this journey started in 2015 when we launched our database migration service. We can see it's foundational in, in, in this vision, if you will. We opened it up at the beginning of this year and over 28,000 databases have migrated since we opened it up. And you can migrate to, from, or within the cloud safely and securely. And the source database will just keep running while you're migrating. It only takes a few minutes to set up. It runs at very, very low cost. Dozens of databases supported, ours and others. So as sources and then targets, including MySQL, Postgres, Maria, Oracle, SQL Server, Redshift, DynamoDB, MongoDB, you get the idea. Very broad set of sources and targets that we support. And when you want to change your engine from one to the other, we have something else called the schema conversion tool. They kind of, we think of it as builds on it that you download and run against it. It creates an assessment report. And you look at your assessment report to guide you on how to go through the migration. It'll take a look at the metadata from your source and then automatically convert to the right format to be using for your target with a high level of automation. And then there's some other work to go do. And that, that's free, and it's also non-disruptive. It doesn't affect your systems to do the planning to go look at what it might be like. So it makes it simple to understand how easy it will be to migrate your databases. There's something else that we're adding. It's called the Workload Qualification Framework. And what the Workload Qualification Framework does is for every workload, you can assess how complex the workload is, how hard it is to migrate, which might need extra work. For example, it might have PL SQL. It might have a lot of different objects in it in the case of Oracle. And it'll help you understand what it's like to go do that. Now, in addition, there's programs to help customers go through this process for those that are looking for database freedom. And database freedom can be about relational to relational, relational to non-relational, data warehouse to data warehouse. It basically works across the portfolio as does uh, DMS, the Database Migration Service. So just as an example uh, of uh, using a DMS, I want to talk about Trimble. Now, I love Trimble as a case because the return was so quick for them. So to give a little bit about the company, they're a global leader in geolocation services based in the UK, government, healthcare, construction, other clients to know where critical items are located when they need to go find them. So uh, they had an Oracle solution. It's over a decade old. Uh, it wasn't flexible. Uh, and uh, it wasn't cost effective, let's say, at that point in time. And so using SCT to analyze it and then DMS to look across it, they migrated their key apps uh, over from Oracle to R uh, RDS for Postgres in six weeks. In six weeks, and it cost 40,000 pounds or around 55,000 US dollars. And immediately, their annual savings were three times that cost, or 165,000 US. And it took them six weeks to do it. And more importantly, it allowed the app to grow and change and use new innovation without the expense of licensing. So it's a great example of what it's like to use the technology to, uh, to have some database freedom. So now we've talked about the database, the analytics, the migration portfolio across it. And I want to talk about artificial intelligence. Now, there are other places at this summit where we're going to be diving deeper into artificial intelligence, so we'll consider this a, a bit of a preview, but I want to give you basically the fundamentals of it. So uh, Amazon has been working with artificial intelligence for over 20 years. It's a key part of our daily operations across the company, from AWS to logistics to new services like Alexa. And we're, we're confident that within a few years, it's going to be bigger than the rest of AWS combined. So why is suddenly AI becoming mainstream? Well, there's three things, really. There's cloud computing and the ability to have all this scale. There's also new low-cost, high-speed processors, and then also new programming frameworks that combine to take it from science fiction to something that we're living with every day. And, and we, we look at this and support a range of different services, reflecting our couple of decades of working with it, which, uh, which I'm going to start at the bottom and walk up. So let's basically start at the bottom. 
So at the bottom, there's the engines that are basically used by the AI engineers. Um, and we do a lot of work with MXNet. We give a lot of contributions back. We also do a lot of work with TensorFlow. And we have a lot of TensorFlow that we're running that you might recognize from another company. And in the middle is the area where the, the data scientists and the, the, the data analysts will go use algorithms reflecting the engines using Amazon's machine learning, EMR, which we've talked about, Spark and machine learning. We'll run the platforms above that so they don't need to know about AI. They need to know about data. The next tier up is the services. And you can see recognition, pattern recognition, poly, which is from text to voice, and then Lex, which is the core of Alexa. So that should seem a little bit familiar. That can be used by developers right off the shelf with no expertise whatsoever in AI. So when people are saying, I'm going to go embrace AI, you can think of, well, at what level of the scientist, at level of the data analyst, and a level of the developer. So there's a, there's a look across the entire portfolio now of database, analytics, and, and AI. So, and with that, um, I want to invite Scott to come up to the stage to talk a little bit about FINRA's journey to use our portfolio. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Scott. Hi, Martin. Hi there. Um, so my name is Scott Donaldson. I'm a, as uh, Dan was like saying, I'm a senior director um, at uh, FINRA in our technology. And over the last three years, we had migrated our applications primarily in our market regulation space um, up onto the cloud. And we're continuing that migration um, to other parts of our organization and, and our technology stack. Just real quick to give a, a brief overview of FINRA that, for those that may or may not know. So we, are, we regulate the stockbroker, the, the equities um, uh, business, uh, equities and options and fixed income. Um, and effectively what we do for at least on the market side, which is the primary house that I work on, is that we kind of reconstruct the market after the fact. We bring in all of the events that are occurring on the exchanges, like NASDAQ, CBOE, NICE, um, as well as from the broker-dealer firm, so from E-Trade, Fidelity, Vanguard, et cetera, of where you might have your, your broker-dealer accounts. And we reconstruct the market, um, and then we basically survey that for rules compliance, um, enforcement actions, and malfeasance in the market, like insider trading or WASH sales and the like. So, you know, our, our job is to really kind of deter and detect um, you know, to really ensure really the integrity in the market to protect the investors such as yourself. And there's over 90 million of them that we review every day. So talking a little bit about how we started to migrate up onto the cloud, you know, taking it back to really where we were at sort of like on-premise. Um, we, this is probably a, a schema that's probably somewhat familiar to a lot of you in the fact that you have a whole bunch of various different application databases, and you end up with a lot of point-to-point -point connections, a, a virtual you know, spider web or spaghetti bowl of connections, and it becomes very problematic to deal with like accounts and reviews and firewall rules and everything like that in isolation. So a natural sort of progression along that was that you started to make like a database hub. Um, like you might have like a central repository for reporting or where applications can go and, and move out of. So we had made that migration um, a long time ago around that. But then it was like, okay, well now we need to, we're starting to try to move this data up onto the cloud. But the issue of it is, is that we literally have hundreds of applications, hundreds of databases. So how do we start to move up onto the cloud, keep them independent of each other so that they can move and still maintain the integrity within the applications and allow them to move by themselves? So what we ended up coming up with is that we highly leveraged the data management services um, that, that Dan spoke of. So at the core of this, we build a system called CRISP. And so the core of it is the change data capture of the data management services. We connect back into our databases that we have on-prem and allow them to replicate tables and schemas back up into the cloud. And it does, we've set this up for bi-directional because as an application starts to move up there, you still might have an application back in your data center that still needs to be able to access that data. So we've enabled effectively two-way replication back and forth across those different hubs. And on top of that, we built like a set of APIs to help streamline sort of the onboarding process around this and built our own set of APIs that allow an application as part of the software delivery lifecycle to actually say, I am now going on board with this new uh, data management services, this published subscribed service, 
what tables that I want to replicate because they might be doing incremental releases throughout. And so we've enabled that through the APIs and it manages all of that and keeps it into a catalog so that as an application, you can come in, you can see well, what's available, what's not available, and it helps streamline that. And it really has helped kind of mitigate sort of the uh, interdependencies between applications that help sort of migrate up there, um, which has been a big boon and a, an accelerator because one of the problems that you always run into is like, I'm trying to move, but I have all of these other dependencies along with that. And that becomes a big challenge for an organization that has hundreds of, of applications to be able to do that. Now, when we look at sort of like analytics, that's the core of what we do at FINRA. Um, and Dan alluded to, uh, you know, just how much time is spent in terms of like infrastructure, provisioning, maintenance around this. And one of our core tenets, one of our architectural goals as we moved to the cloud was to separate down and isolate all of this infrastructure services so as applications and analytic services moved up to the cloud that we were not reinventing the wheel multiple times over across different applications. So a couple of things that were core to that were, one, as we moved up there, we wanted to have a central data lake and a central data repository. Um, we wanted to manage access control um, and have an abstraction layer around that. Um, and when we started uh, three, three and a half years ago, there really wasn't necessarily a, a, a good data management service um, that was one that was a great fit for what it was. And so we built our own at that point in time, um, and we've actually open sourced that. It's called Herd. It's up on, uh, up on our uh, JIT repository um, that folks can go and look at. But that allows us to deal with a level of, it has a central meta store um, and a reference data and allows you to have sort of like this register your schemas as a publisher and a subscriber, allows us to be able to build off lineages and we understand who's using what data and, and that we can be able to track that. But having that central service allowed then the application teams and the analytic teams to focus on the true value, which is the analytics that the business users or the data scientists want to be able to do. And so we have the wide variety of, of use cases here in terms of you got sort of just raw discovery and research. You're looking and just kind of mulling through the data, trying to figure out to very customized um, market reconstructions um, and everything in between in terms of like audit trails that we need to be able to do. And by separating this has allowed us to, to really focus around this and help basically continue to evolve our analytics and keep up with the changing regulatory landscape, the changing exchange landscape um, that, uh, that moves along within the area. Now, when we look at our analytics infrastructure, you'll see a, a large number of services that are in use. So one, when we bring our data in, we're running it through a set of ETL services. We are huge users of Amazon EMR. We run it through data validation services. So our, we type check the information, we have to like validate it. We run a variety of checks to actually, before we pass the data into our analytics and around that. We run it through a normalization. So we bring in data from a variety of different sources. And so one of our challenges is to do cross market and cross product types of surveillances. You need to have that in a common format and an understanding. But for us, we are a regulatory agency. You need to keep the fidelity and know exactly what was originally submitted to you. So we keep both the raw copy and this data process copy, and we have the points back to that. Now, one of the things that is, is critical within this data management is as much as we love to have perfect data from the get-go, that doesn't always occur. You get data corrections. You get resubmissions of, of data. So you have new versions of data. And one of the problems that we dealt with back on site when you were sitting like in a database or a big data warehouse type of appliance is versioning data sets is difficult. You, but what by moving our data and having it in S3 and storing it into objects on S3, we could create new versions of the objects. So we treated started treating data as immutable. That allowed us now to look at deltas between the versions. So if I needed to see how did this data look on January versus how did it look in March, we can be able to run that sort of comparison if we needed to. Now, once we have that data basically into our catalog, we then will take that and move it into a variety of different sources. We can query it through analytic tools like EMR, like Presto and Hive. Um, and initially, most of our migration was focused on Hive. We came from a world where we were very data warehouse centric, so we had a lot of SQL. Like some of our patterns in SQL might be, we have some patterns that SQL statements that are 80 pages long. 
um, of, of just pure SQL that are creating temp tables and range and look and windowing functions, um, and is very complex. So initially, to make the migration, we were big users of Hive. Um, and then we started using like Tez, and now more recently, we've been evolving into, into Spark. But the, the EMR provided us that elasticity um, within the environment to be able to grow and separate the various different concerns so we could run batch analytics and interactive analytics separately from each other, whereas before, we were always colliding. Literally, like, I would be... I would have my interactive users trying to run a query and the performance would fall down because somebody ran like a big ad hoc query, some data scientists would do that and it would literally bring the machine down to its knees because they're consuming all the resources. Up in Amazon, I don't have that problem. I have my core object sitting in S3 and now I can spin up a Hive cluster or a Spark cluster or a Presto and each use case can have its own cluster and when they're done, we put the cluster away, the data is still there. So we're really treating that data as immutable. But we have a variety of these batch analytics. We run interactive analytics um, over the top of this. And a lot of the interactive analytics are um, our own custom applications that we've built, um, primarily like in Angular, um, using like Node.js, but interacting with Redshift, with RDS on occasion, but a lot of it EMR, like Presto and, and Hive and Spark. Um, and that, again, the it, we look at optimizing the data, or I'll say the use case around this, and the, the, the analytic engine, based on what is the use case. Um, and so having the variety of different tools allows us to manage that. On any given day, we run anywhere from ETL to interactive analytics, we spin up anywhere between 35 to 60,000 nodes of EMR every day. Um, and it varies because the market volumes vary. So when we have a breakout and you have a high volume or high vol file volatile day, excuse me, then the EMR scales up with the data volumes. And we're, so we've, we've tooled our, our batch jobs and our analytics to, to take advantage of that elastic capability. And so some examples that we kind of like are doing, we create like heat maps and we can integrate various different data sets. We're using data science and regression analysis. So there we're calculating these regression models in Spark and then allowing the users to visualize it and detect anomalies. You're providing trend information or volume information, allows them to work and interact with this data. Um, the, the idea around this is how to make it usable and how to make it fast and interactive. And using the combination of the various different tools and caching mechanisms allow you to be able to get to that aspect. Now, a core thing that any organization faces is what are you doing from the data science perspective? Um, and we had that same sort of challenge. These are our, our folks that are sort of like our quants, our research folks that look at helping develop or prototyping new surveillance models is typically what they're looking at. So they're trying to do feature development. They're trying to create new models and how do they need to be able to do that? Well, in the old world, they were sitting there, they would have their, they would either have their workstation or a server sitting there at their desktop. They would put in a request to technology, say, hey, give me a big copy of data or give me access to this database. And then they would like pull down you know, spend all their time pulling down the data. Then they would work and massage the data themselves. Then they would finally get to the point where they're running their models. So what we built, and then the other problem was is that all of these various different users had different versions of R packages, had different versions of Python packages. So taking that and trying to actually make that into a production system was extremely difficult. So we, we wanted to standardize that. So we created a community of practice of the data scientists, and we created what we called like our universal data science platform. So the they get to pick and choose like what is the version and the models that they want to be able to do and be able to apply this. They can then spin up instances on their own um, using, again, the power of EC2 and, and EMR and the data catalog. They extract that information down and they can pick GPU type machines, they can pick memory type machines, and then they can run their R models, their Python models, um, whatever it is that they want to be able to do and use the various different AI and machine learning libraries to then conduct and, and experiment with their models. That is now becoming the foundation of, our, um, of most of our batch surveillance. So whereas before we were very rule-based in terms of a lot of SQL, we are now moving into a much more model-based type of detection and continuing sort of that evolution using the, the power of different machine learning libraries. So you know, when you're looking at AWS services, it's pretty daunting, right? You, you saw the, the opening slide that Dan came up with. There's literally dozens of choices, and it's never easy to figure out what is the right one. 
And I guess my suggestion is, is pick the best one that you think that is right for the use case, but know that it's going to change. So we started off using Hive, and then we kind of migrated over to Tez, and now we're moving all of those types of jobs into Spark because now we're seeing anywhere from 10 to 20 time performance improvement, which allows us to reduce down our cluster size, reduce our run rates, and reduce our cost of what the operation is. We did the same thing in terms of like looking at Redshift. We created, we came from these data warehouse appliances, so it was a natural fit into Redshift. From there, we've continued to kind of migrate and, and take advantage of that, but now we're moving into taking advantage of the data lake um, in terms of like using things like Presto, um, and we're looking at how we can start to move that from a Presto and where we're managing the clusters ourselves to looking at Athena and QuickSight and some of those other ones. So the evolution that you are going to go through is the one constant is that you're going to change. These services continue to evolve, and you want to evolve and take advantage of that as your use cases evolve and learn from the you know, learn from the usage. One of the key things that we are able to get from all the various different logs is we have now much more great, we have greater insight into what the, the users and the programs are doing that allows us to then learn from that and adapt the service levels and the clusters that we are running against. And the, you know, I will, like, an example just sort of like of this is not just of the services, but also looking at the instance types as well. Um, a, an example was, we went out initially with our first audit trail system. Um, and with that, we ran about 150 nodes of EMR and we were running high with Tez um, on that. And it was a combination of M-class and C-class machines. We quickly, so the users, we had based that on what were sort of the, you know, basically we looked at the, the logs of what types of queries the users had been running back on premises in our own data center. And we used that to set up the partitioning schemes and the like. What we soon found out is that the users, now that they were sort of unbridled, that they could query in, in different ways, is that they were querying in, in much more greater spans of data. So whereas before we would return 100, 200,000 rows of data and allow them start to work and sort with that, we had some users creating data marts of like a billion, five billion rows and analyzing that because now they had the capability to look at a firm over a period of months and do that themselves as opposed to picking up the phone and asking technology to run a set of queries or a data scientist to run these queries themselves. So then we moved from M class and C class, we moved to a bunch of R class machines because of the higher memory requirements and the joins that we were doing. And then that was, all that required was basically a reconfiguration and a redeployment of our, of our, of our cluster creation scripts. No software change. All we did is literally update our cloud deploy scripts and rebuilt the cluster, and then we moved from that. And from there, we continued to kind of like evolve. So it's a, it's a, you, and we did that in a period of months, whereas before you would have been locked in literally for, okay, I did my capital expenditure, I'm locked into that you know, infrastructure footprint for three years because that's where you're, you're at and you had already bought that. So when you look at you know, the, the capability that the cloud offers you, these were a few of the quotes um, you know, from, from some of our different users. The net of it is, is that I kind of like call it, you know, it's the democratization, it's that citizen analytics. It's giving them the power. Um, my goal in terms of delivering analytics to our users is to empower them to query and access the data and give them that freedom to, to find the information and use it and make it usable and get technology out of the way. So it's providing them services and platforms along that. And along the way, by moving up to the cloud, we've been able to optimize sort of our interactive and our batch experience. We've removed a lot of these conflicts and dependencies along the way. Um, and ultimately that has created, gr and we spend less time on dealing with infrastructure, which has allowed us to take those investment dollars in our IT budget and apply them to the higher level analytics, which better serves the customer and they can reinvest. And now you start to see this, you know, upward spiral, instead of a downward spiral, you see an upward spiral, spiral of IT in terms of sort of the value that you can provide in terms of end user analytics and the like. So uh, with that, I think we're wrapping up um, and I think we're just about on time um, and we're happy to hang around a little bit afterwards. I know we have the keynote here in a little bit, but um, Dan and I are happy to, to stick around and, and answer some questions for folks off of the stage. Just one thing I wanted to yep. just comment on is, it's easy to see why more than 90% of our features and services are directly in response to what customers have asked for. So thanks very much, Scott. Really Thank appreciate you. you doing such a great job of covering Thank that. You.
We'll be here for questions, recognizing that it's a keynote for you to go to in right now. Thanks. Very cool. Nicely done.